today I'm going to speak about Susan Laurie Park's Top Dog Underdog and try to explain how you might read it for the first time, make an entryway into it, and make some sense of it if you have no background with it. What are some of the things you do to make sense of a literary text when you are reading it for the first time? When I'm reading a literary text for the first time, I typically go back to what I was taught in high school and what was reiterated in college, and that is look for three basic things. You're looking for characters. So who are these people? Where do they come from? Why do they think the way they do? Why do they feel the way they do? Why do they behave the way they do? What kind of interactions do they have with each other? And the reason I do that is because I'm trying to figure out if I can identify with one of the characters as soon as possible. I'm also going to look for setting because sometimes the setting can tell me something about what this play is going to be about. And if I recognize the setting, maybe I can see myself in that environment and that can also help me to identify with the play a little bit quicker. Um, I'm going to try to see if I can connect the setting to the characters. So is the setting informing the way the characters think about things? Because that can also help me make a better sense of what I'm seeing the first time through. My goal is to try to identify with the text as quickly as possible so that I don't just give up on it right away. Because I might be inclined to just say, you know what, I don't get this, I'm out. But if I can see my way in, I might hang on a little bit longer, and usually the thing will start to open up at some point. But the first thing I'm going to look for, in this case, is a title. Because it's an interesting title, and with Top Dog, Underdog, I think the author is telling us something right from the very beginning, even before you open up the book. So what does the title of the text tell you before you even started to read the book? I think when you look at Top Dog, Underdog, you're thinking that this book is going to be about power. About who has it, who doesn't, how do you get it, how do you hold on to it, how do you express it, and what happens if you don't have it. I think that's probably going to be an important part of this as well. Does the text confirm your initial ideas about power? I think it does. So when you look at the characters, go back to the beginning, right? You look at the characters first. These are two poor black men who are struggling to get by. That they're, they're waiting on money here and there. They depend on that check that Lincoln brings back at the end of every week. Um, so during the week, things are very tense and very dicey. Um, they really have no important social role in the community around them. So they feel disempowered, they feel very disenfranchised. Um, they're almost like shadowy, shadowy figures of the people in the culture who really have the power to control it. Um, so Booth expresses the power he has by stealing and then bringing his, um, you know, uh, winnings you know, back to the house, and then they kind of joke about the fact that he's so good at this. And then Lincoln is trying to be legitimate, right? but even his job tells us something about how he's valued in this culture. What does Lincoln's job tell us? Lincoln's job is to die convincingly every day. That's the value of his life. Are there other places that you see the theme of power at work? There are. There are other places that you do see the theme of power at work. As the play progresses, you start to realize that there is a power dynamic that gets expressed between the brothers, that gets expressed between the brothers and their significant others. In this case, it's Lincoln's uh, ex-wife and it's Booth's girlfriend, Grace. You also see it in the three-card Monty game, which is sort of the centerpiece of the book, and it's the thing that brings the two brothers together. As we learn more about their background, more about the tension between them, we start to see Lincoln realizing that he's got to put Booth back into his place, and Booth is pushing, Lincoln is pushing. You know Lincoln is not going to let his brother better him. And so at the very end, he has to push as hard as he possibly can. It gets to the point where you realize that Booth understands that he doesn't think he has anything left to lose. And I tell students this all the time. When you put somebody in a position where they truly believe they have nothing left to lose, they become dangerous. And that's why the play ends up moving in the tragic direction that it does, because Booth has to express himself the final and only way that he can, and it goes very badly. But the play is really about something else, and what the play is about is why does it have to happen this way? Is there a way to make this scenario different? Is there a way to change the characters, the settings in such a way that you don't lead to this inevitable tragic conclusion? Because that would make the play a piece of social criticism which is completely consistent with the kind of work that Parks does. And what it does is suggest that at the end of the day, the bigger role of art is that it has this socially transformative power. It can change people's lives, make them grow and make them understand themselves. It can make themselves understand their relationship to the world around them better and the way that world affects the way they think and the way they behave. And it shows 
not only the power of the play, but the power of art in general.